in 2018 in Budapest, Hungary, at the World Curling Congress, I was elected to the board of the World Curling Federation. And so there, there are eight of us on the board, and um, and I love it. I absolutely love it. It's some of the greatest people on the earth. Um, and you as golfer, uh, you as a golfer, would pick it up really, really fast, and you'd very much much appreciate sort of the traditions of the sport and the camaraderie of the sport. And uh, I really honestly believe that if the world has had more curlers, the world will be a better place. And I think the same can be said about golf as well. So I just feel very fortunate to be involved in these two really special sports. Bo, great to be with you. Great to be here, Tom. Thanks so much for coming on the Golfer's Journal podcast. And last time, let's see, last time I saw you, I think I was falling asleep on the bus uh, coming back from the, we're sitting next to each other, coming back from the, the Ryder Cup, I believe. You're, I think you're exactly right. I thought we were going to go uh, standing over that hole, drinking uh, a few few cocktails, but you're right. There was a little episode on the bus after that. Yes. They, uh, we, uh, Maybe we those made are it correlated. Back. <laughs> Perhaps. We, we made it back alive, and um, it's, it's great to have you on the pod. And while we were on the bus, or no, let's see. It was while we were on the pat. While we're on the patio, right, uh, by the 16, at the courtesy tents there at Whistling Straits, where we got into talking about, maybe because we were in Wisconsin, who knows, but we got into talking about the great sport of curling. Uh, and you're the way that you got into it. I, I, I missed all the golf, let's be honest. Um, we waited there all day for the golfers to come by, and then and then I just was, we were talking curling, and uh, and then we were on a bus. So with the with the winter games here, you know, I thought I I, I want to get Bo on the pod. I want to talk about curling because every four years they come along, and for whatever reason, there's always a lot of curling on TV. Um, you know, for of the sports that are featured, and so people get into it, you know, and then four years, and th- and then you're not into it for another four years, and then you're they're into it. You're into it all the time. So I want to get into a discussion about curling what makes it so special how you got into it because you're coming to us from the great state of south carolina am i correct that's right the curling hotbed that it is the curling capital of yeah of the south um (laughs) so it's it's an obvious connection but while i was doing the research for this pod so before we get into curling and this is to prove that i do do research for these things bo and uh we've met on a few different occasions uh you're one of the nicest guys in golf um and I, but now you're also one of the most interesting men in golf. Our Jimmy Dunn podcast, <laughs> he was before he was the most interesting man in golf. And I think <laughs> you're giving him a run for his money because I had no idea that you've got to tell us the story of your journey into golf architecture. If you can give us the, the five minute version, but I had no idea that you majored in physics at Brown, you know, um, good school. Uh, that you went to Trinity in Dublin, pretty good school as well. Studied Irish drama and poetry. That your favorite books are Ulysses, and you're into Yeats, <laughs> and that you had a a poem published when you were eight years old in a vault, obviously in Ebony magazine. So. <laughs> What a life you've lived, and now you're designing golf courses with Tiger Woods. Do you, you want really to have done your research? You, you uh, want to connect I, some of the dots? Let's be honest, folks. It's all on your website. But um, do you want to connect some of those dots for us, Bo? Yeah. So, I mean, I started off playing golf when I was two years old, and I'm I'm about to turn 52. So we're almost 50 years into playing the game, and you would think I would be a better player uh, by now, but but I'm not. But it's always been a big part of my life. Um, big orientation to my family, my father. Uh, we were very fortunate growing up that we had family friends that were Augusta National members and family, different family friends that were Cypress Point members. And, and so having a, the opportunity to go to the sort of these cathedrals of golf as a young person was really, really special. And they both have been designed by Alistair McKenzie. And I, I didn't even know golf course design was even a thing. And then all of a sudden, this man that I've never heard of has, has produced these two most special places that I'd ever been to on with golf clubs in my hand. And so that created my sort of initial fascination with golf course design um, and golf course architecture. And I was the kind of kid that sort of drew holes. I, I think I was probably a creative kid um, in many ways. And uh, I did start writing poetry. And I found this like 
writer's publisher journal thing and and young people could submit magazine uh, content to Ebony Junior magazine. <laughs> and I think I was so young, I didn't put that together as to what that even was. I was just excited that this was uh, this was uh, an opportunity. So I sent in a haiku and it got published, <laughs> so um, cool. which was kind of kind of interesting. But in any event, I, uh, I played high school golf, um, you know, junior golf, or high school golf. And uh, I did go to Brown University. I, I would say that I, I may have just gotten in because I was uh, maybe a token South Carolina guy. But published I did poet. Go. So that yeah, I was hurt. a published poet. I'm not sure I put that on my on my application. I should have. Um, did you play on the golf I, team? Uh, I did play on the golf team. I started to play on the basketball team, and uh, and, and you're a hoopster. I, yeah, I'm a hoopster. I was a, I was bas- basketball and golf were my sports growing up. And so I started to play basketball, and then I realized that. I was really gonna have to study for the first time in my life and basketball is a lot of time. And I ended up sort of deciding maybe my athletic career was at, at, a, at an end. And, uh, but the sports information director happened to be the golf, co- the golf coach. And so he, he coaxed me into playing on the golf team. And, uh, and so I, as I say, I, I played on the NCAA powerhouse Brown bear golf team for a few <laughs> years, which was a fun experience, get to play a lot of great places in the Northeast and make yeah. great, sort of friendships, but, uh, Brown's, you know, the sort of wacky weird place where there are no real rules. I mean, there's no, there's no curriculum there, there's, you just take whatever you want and grades are optional. Um, which for a person like me that had all these varied interests, it was perfect. Right. Yeah. Um, but after a couple of years, you kind of have to say you're going to do something. And so I was debating, do I do physics or science or do I do art? And like, that's how coherent I was. <laughs> and I literally woke up one morning with a this sort of epiphany of like, wait a minute, golf course design, that's sort of, you know, artistic and creative, but engineering and technical. Yeah. And right across the street from Brown was the Rhode Island School of Design. And we as Brown students were allowed to take classes there. So I started taking landscape architecture at RISD. Wow. And then, and then Tom Fazio was building a golf course in my hometown. Um, and my father was one of the developers of that project. And, uh, so I started calling Tom and asking him, how does one become a golf course designer? And he basically had to answer my phone call. Cause I was like a son, son of a client. And that ultimately led to me going to work for him as a summer job and kind of did that kind of all throughout college. But my mother is half Irish. And so at one point I got kind of tired of being in, in Rhode Island, just being rain and, and cold and whatnot all the time. So I, I thought it made a lot of sense to take a leave of absence, go to Ireland, like as if that wasn't rain and cold and whatnot. <laughs> For a change. But I did in, that. In the, the weather. <laughs> I yeah. did that and uh, coaxed my way into being a visiting student at Trinity College, Dublin. And I was very much admitted to study physics while I was there. And I, I didn't want to just do that. I wanted to study other things like you've read Irish drama and literature and history and stuff. And so I, I kept bugging the provost to allow me to do that. And he kept saying, well, that's not how it works here. You can't do that. You've been admitted into the the, the, the maths department, actually. And um, and so I kept after him, kept after him. And finally, about six months into it, he said, listen, if you promise to never come back to my office again, I'll let you sit whatever exams you want, so long as you never come back to see me again. So I ended up, I ended up doing that and was able to have this sort of more well-rounded sort of experience at Trinity, which was, which was wonderful. So... Trinity. And then at some point you're in the, you're in the business world and then you come back to Fazio. Um, is that the progression of things if I'm correct? That's right. So after, after college, I ended up going to business school and kind of went down this different path that led me to investment banking, but always stayed in touch with Tom because he was, he's a fun guy and connected guy and opinionated guy. Yeah. And so at some point he sort of coaxed me into, why don't you come, come back to golf and, and, if he were here, he'd say that I was his business guy, which meant different things to him. But I basically helped him with sort of the overall sort of operation. And uh, and it was, it was wild because I was like 26, seven years old when he sort of gave me this pretty, pretty significant role in his organization. So it was a uh, it was a great person to really lo- learn the, um, the the golf course architecture from as, as well as sort of the business of golf course architecture. I wonder if you were able to connect your Irish and golf uh, interests. Did you work with him at uh, Waterville at all? I did. And so the Waterville story is that um, my family was over being the sort of half Irish family. We used to sort of the greater family would get together in Ireland sometimes and we'd go to different places for a holiday. And so we happened to be on 
I rented some houses on Valencia Island, kind of there off the off the coast of Kerry. And yeah. uh, and Tom called me and said, "Hey, these guys, these Wingfoot guys, uh, they, they own a golf course over there." And they called me and and I talked to them for a while, and they really want to get us involved. But you know me, like I don't I don't really want to go overseas, and I you know I don't know, and you know just to get into kind of. To get him off the phone, I said I would I, that you were over there, and that you know maybe I could just get you to go by and just go look at this place. And I'm thinking, Tom, come on! I mean, like I'm a, I'm in the I'm a, a speck of dirt of rock off the off the in the North Atlantic in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. I mean, there's no way you're going to be able to name a golf course that makes any sense for me to leave and go. I was like, what's the name of it? He's like, oh, it's, it's water something. And I was like, Waterville, Waterville Golf Links? Are you kidding me? I was like, I played golf there this masterpiece. morning. Masterpiece. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so that sort of led to us sort of getting involved. And then ultimately Tom, who was also, his mother's half Irish, um, or he got sort of bitten by the bug. And, and so Waterville came a very special place to kind of all of us, uh, at the Fazio group. Very cool. And it's, and he did it, you did, you, he, you together did a nice job there and well, you can't go. Yeah, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. Um, a lot of people's favorite, we know when Americans go over there, uh, an easy favorite for folks, uh, gorgeous yet playable. And we have something in common there, Bo. Uh, okay. I still have a deposit at Trinity college because when I finished oh, my wow. undergrad, I, I like you, um, though I did have to have a major and a little more idea. I didn't know what I wanted to do either in any event. So right. I applied to a writing program and I, I applied to uh, Trinity as well. So I got into Trinity. I was waitlisted at the writing program I wanted to get, get into. Okay. And, uh, and didn't know until late August that someone, one of the five fiction writers dropped out. I got the spot and my, uh, and I had to call Trinity and say, I'm not coming. I was leaving like three days later for Ireland and oh, who wow. knows which way my wife, my, my, sorry, my life and wife. Uh, how things would have gone if that person didn't uh, decide to not go to the writing program where I, you know, pursued my writing and golf and all that stuff. So um, in any event, uh, a beautiful place uh, to visit if you're in Dublin. But your life, you go on from there. Now you've got Bow Welling Design. You've done some great projects, pretty exciting things going on at PGA. Well, PGA Frisco has got to be the big one. Uh, I mean, is it finished? Is, are, what's going on down there? Yeah, so PJ Frisco's uh, new project north of Dallas that uh, PJ of America is moving their headquarters there. So their headquarters is under construction. Uh, Omni Hotel is the is the big sponsor and is building a 540 room Omni Hotel. Um, but their the golf facility is uh, two championship golf courses. So Gill has done the East Course, which has mm -hmm. been set up for the spectator events. Uh, the PJ is committed. 26 uh, events so far to there, including the, the um, two PGA championships. The 2023 senior PGA championship will be the first event played. But then we did the West course um, as well as helped with sort of the master planning of the whole thing. And Gil and I collaborated on a short course, which was a lot of fun. And uh, it's just going to be a really cool place. So it's, it's to answer your question, it's done. The golf elements are done. They're grassed. Uh, it's not open yet because there's still all this vertical construction that's happening between the headquarters oh, right. and the resort clubhouses. There's a whole bunch of big retail village that's a part of it. Um, but all, all of it's set to open in about a year's time. And it's going to be a big deal because it's, I think it's really going to, I'm biased, but I think it's going to become sort of the home of, of us golf. Um, and with the PGA of America who are really, frankly, the organization that can impact the game and in some ways the most, because they, they have 28,000 members around the country. So they're all going to be able to get to Dallas relatively easy in terms of airlift. Mm -hmm. So I think the effect that PJ Frisco will have on the game here in the United States is going to be very significant. It's just been a real honor to be involved in it. That's pretty exciting. Sounds like a future Golfer Journal event venue for sure. Yeah, for sure. 36 holes. You fly into, how far is it from, let's see, flying to Dallas and then... I don't know yeah, it's about half an hour from the airport. All right, done. I'm there. Well, yeah, keep us in mind. Like to be there to celebrate the opening with you. What else is For going sure. on at Bow Welling Design? And of course, you collaborate. How did you get involved working with, um, with Mr. Woods? Um, so I, I, I met um, the first Masters that Tiger played as a professional was '97, and. Uh, and I met Greg McLaughlin there, who had just been um, selected to be the executive director of the Tiger Woods Foundation. And Greg and I sort of developed a relationship, and that ultimately led to us getting involved uh, when the foundation built the Tiger Woods Learning Center in Anaheim. So we helped with the golf elements there. 
uh, which included a range and uh, putting kind of experience. But uh, kind of through that, I got to know Earl Woods as well as Tiger some. And Earl and I would always sort of joke about when's Tiger going to do um, get involved in golf. And it was sort of this big running thing that he and I had a little bit of sort of trash talking thing, um, but it was fun. And uh, in event, at some point along the way, a few years later, um, Tiger had an opportunity and he wanted to um, talk to me about it. And so I went and met with him and uh, and ended up helping him sort of just as a favor, really, um, because I was still working for, for, for Tom Fazio. Um, and it, it ultimately just sort of morphed into us having a relationship. And then when I left Tom to start my own company, um, he was actually my first client. So he ended up hiring me to, to help him with his first golf design effort. And we've had an ongoing relationship since. Now, when you're trash talking with Earl and Tiger Woods, is it like, you couldn't design a golf course if it, you know, you don't know how to do that. Like, what do you say? Oh, it was not, not Tiger. It was just Earl, but he was, uh, he, he, he just was really excited about, about the future of, of them being involved in golf courses. Let's just leave it at that. All right. Fair enough. And you, he's done some awesome stuff. We met down at Blue Jack National, um, that's right. which is such a blast. And I think that's, and I haven't been out to Payne's Valley because your invitation keeps getting lost in my, it must be going straight to my spam. Um, but we're going to figure it out. Uh, yeah. I'm eager to, I'm eager to get out to the Big Cedar Lodge and check that out. But, you know, we've talked about, you know, Tiger's design, his ideas, you know, that uh, playability seems to be a big one. Um, definitely wants you to enjoy the experience. And while Blue Jack is not an easy golf course, um, it's a it's a gorgeous golf course. Uh, it's 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 you're probably not going to lose a golf ball. And I know that was something that that Tiger talks about uh, in just the joy and the enjoyment. Um, is that something that's probably a little bit different than what you might have learned from Tom Fazio? How do you? How do yeah, the two I mean, I think with Tom having a, I mean, I think one of the reasons. Tiger sought me out is sort of this experience of being around Tom, who was very into playability. So I think that was very important for Tiger. He's very intentional from the very, very beginning about what he wanted to do in terms of golf course design and, 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 and wanting to be present opportunities really for anybody to play regardless of skill level was very, very important to him. At the same time, he wants, he wanted sort of, you know, strategic tests of golf and so I think Blue Jack's a perfect example where I, I think he's put that together very well in that, to your point, you don't really lose a golf ball. But if you want to go to Blue Jack and score, you better be ready to hit some pretty precise shots, mm -hmm. which is going to help you if you're coming in from the right angle in many cases. Um, and you better be re ready to make some putts that, that break a, a decent amount. So um, he's a big student of Lynx golf, big fan of Lynx golf. And uh, and so I think this idea of, of – you know, being able to use the ground is something he talks a lot about. And so I think at Blue Jack, he very much tried to, to do that with those big, big sort of approaches and surrounds that are shortcut. So, so the, the, especially the higher handicapper in particular has the ability to even put the ball onto the green from off the green. So. Yeah. Uh, I did that a few times myself. Did you guys yeah. bond over talking about, I know he's, he's been to Waterville, hasn't he? Um, he has. Yeah. Romero used to take him over to Ireland and they'd have a, his pictures are still all around the southwest of Ireland, wherever you go. Yep. Um, well, that's pretty cool. And like, you know, well, Blue Jack, yeah, great golf course. Did you have anything to do with the halfway house? Um, which has to be the largest in golf. And I know that people go to play golf at Blue Jack National outside of Houston and might just get stuck in the halfway house because it's like yep. the food hall at Harrods. It's absolutely insane. Yeah, we did. So Blue Jack's a little bit of a unique situation for us in that we assisted Tiger with the golf course design efforts, but then our company also did all of the master planning, all the amenity planning uh, at Blue Jack. So all the sort of fun stuff we would have been involved in as well. So got a lot of fun uh, stuff. Yeah. Yep. You, got, you know, you got the pitch and putt at night that, that's that's lit up that's right. and, um, and the little diner there. And um, it's just, I mean, you did Bravo, Bo. I, I think it's every, a fun one. For every sure. golf course should have a... Uh, uh, a massive uh, halfway house with 20 food stations and grilled cheese bars and things like that. Um, it's, it, it's really, really cool. So you guys have done some fun stuff together and you've got more fun stuff coming. Any updates on what's going on in Chicago? Yeah, we continue to be very vested and interested in Chicago and um, you know, the Obama presidential center is under construction now, mm -hmm. which is um, probably helps a little bit in, in, some of our efforts, but anyway, we're, I was on the phone with them, um, 
last week, you know, a couple of times. So we're still very, very hopeful. We're still very uh, encouraged and, and, and optimistic that we'll be able to do something, but there's still a lot of process and some political stuff to kind of work through. Um, but I, 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 you know, one of the things that Tiger talked about when he first started in terms of golf course design was being, was wanting to be involved in meaningful projects. And I think meaningful can mean different things, but in terms of the impact, I think that that project has, uh, the, the potential it has to make on the South side of Chicago is, uh, I, I can't think of anything kind of more meaningful than that. So we, we remain very hopeful and, and, uh, that we'll be able to get the green light to go forward. Yeah, it would be hugely impactful. So we're wishing you and Tiger all the best with that. Um, would just be amazing um, for that vision to come to life. Are you involved in um, the pop stroke at all as, as a Tiger? I'm not really. I When it of- first started, we assisted a little bit, but uh, we're, we're, we're not really involved in that anymore. No, I was wondering if you would, using your um, talents to design a, uh, a putting course, a short. So what it, it's like, is it putt putt? Is that what the deal is? It's uh, but a it's putting like golf experience. Holes. Putting experience. Okay. They, they look, they present much more like real golf holes. So it's yeah. all artificial turf, but they're bunkers and landscaping, which the bunkers are artificial turf, but the landscaping is real. And uh, it very much has an environment that feels not, not like putt putt. Yeah. Um, they're, 36 holes are sort of a more challenging 18, a, a more playable 18. Looks all fun. centered around, yeah, food and beverage and activation. And it's really cool. And it's what's really cool to go go to them and see is really the demographics that are using pop stroke because yeah. uh, it's really all over the charts, both in terms of age, you know, any, any demographic measure you look at. And uh, it's really neat. And, I, and, and somebody asked me the other day, like, why is that? And I think it's because everybody can putt or said differently, nobody can putt, right? So it's like super accessible really to everybody. Yeah, it looks like a lot of fun. Eager to get one up in my neck of the woods. Um, good segue though, because like you say, putting is a non-intimidating um, element perhaps of the game of golf. Everyone can putt, nobody can putt. And that takes us to the game of curling. When you look at uh, the winter games, the slalom or the ski jump or really anything at all. Uh, I Very intimidating. I can't do any of that. But I get excited about curling because anybody can curl, but yet nobody can curl. It is one of those sports. That's- and with the ridiculous ideas that I kick around here um, for projects or, or pieces, um, I've thought about, all right, what if I took a year and did nothing but curl? Could I make the Olympics? You know, it's it's one of those things that you're watching and you get into it. But part of the reason you get so fascinated with it is that like, wow, people really dedicate. How dedicated are people to this? Is this really an an Olympic sport sliding along and like pushing the broom? And and so it's just sort of fascinating to watch in that regard. Um, But it it has it's a sport with an incredible history, um, a history that's actually there's a tie to golf that I'm sure we'll we'll talk about um, in terms of the equipment. Uh, But I want to talk about you, uh, Bo Welling, in South Carolina, and your love of curling and how you got tied uh, a, a, to the point where, if I'm, are you on? You're on the board of the United States Curling Association. Is that correct? I, I, I I've been on the board in the past. I'm actually on the board of the World Curling Federation right now. Oh. So I'm I'm one of I'm one of eight people governing the sport of curling on the planet Earth. They did, okay. Let's remember where this conversation started, folks. Um, playing golf at two years old, uh, writing poetry, studying in Ireland. And now you are uh, one of the eight people, uh, caretakers, top caretakers of the sport of curling. How the heck does that happen? So it's a bit of a long story. I'll try to give you a semi-abbreviated version. But uh, I, curling became a demonstration sport in the 1988 Calgary Winter Olympics. So I was 18 years old, sports fanatic. And all of a sudden, here's a sport that I've never heard of that's in the Olympics. And I was like, how can this be? Like, how is this even possible? And I went out of my way to learn about it. And I see rocks, brooms, ice. And I think this is like the dumbest thing I, I've ever seen. Yeah. And uh, I kind of forget about it. Fast forward 14 years later, come home, uh, turn on late that one night, turn on the television. And lo and behold, there are rocks, brooms and ice being broadcast live from Salt Lake City into 
uh, or, or Salt Lake games into my television in Greenville, South Carolina. And I just, I have no idea what I'm watching. I knew it was curling, uh, but I find myself inextricably drawn to the television. I'm just like in this wrapped like state. And I go into the Fazio office the next day and tell the, the guys what had happened to me. And one of Tom's longtime guys, Andy Banfield, pipes up that, you know, he's originally from Northern Ontario, Canada, and that he had grown up curling. And Andy started explaining the rules of the game to me. And so I went home that night, watched some more, came back and what, you know, asked more and more questions. And the more I did, the more fascinated I got. And I think the reasons are, it's a very, very strategic game, which very much sort of fits how my mind is oriented. And then, as you sort of alluded to, it's, it is related to it's an ancient Scottish game. So it's, it's somewhat like a cousin or sister to golf. And to this day, it's very obvious to me that golf and curling come out of the same sort of Scottish ether. Like they both were invented in Scotland about the same time. They both have uh, angles are very important in both of them. Um, They both have their own jargon or terms that are somewhat strange sounding to, to non golfers, non curlers. Uh, They both are camaraderie based. And, and, and at the end of the day, like you might even argue that both of them are excuses to drink scotch, right? Mm. There are these sports, as you alluded to, that you, you can, anybody can do them, but kind of nobody can master them. And right. you can do them your entire life. It doesn't matter how old you are. So all that was very fascinating to me being a golf person. And then, as you also mentioned, I do have this degree in physics. So the nerd in me, I think, liked the physics of curling, the trajectories, friction, you know, these yeah. kinds of things. So that was Salt Lake. Um the next um, the Olympics was uh, was oh, sorry sorry that was that was yeah that was the Salt Lake Winter Olympics and then the next one was in Torino in Italy and so you said there was a lot of coverage of curling and so what had happened curling is very long to to play so it it is it's on almost every day during the Winter Olympics and so what had happened along the way is that uh, one of the big downhill races couldn't be played because of weather. And so they, they cut to curling and they cut to curling and then they started to build this audience. And so yeah. anyway, in 2006, NBC had 80 hours of live coverage of curling <laughs> from Torino. And I basically stopped working for two weeks and just stay at home and watch curling. I cannot get enough of this. I, I'm obsessing over this. And I kept seeing that the, all the U.S. athletes, male and female, were from the same place. And this place was Bemidji, Minnesota. And I thought, this seems strange. You have this two teams they're all from the same town that I've never heard of. Huh. So I go online and I learned that Bemidji is where the, you know, where the Mississippi river starts. It's where Paul Bunyan and babe, the blue ox are mythically from. And it's, and it's this town that's like ground zero for curling in the United States, just super into curling. And that Bemidji was going to be hosting the U S national championships about two weeks after the Torino winter Olympics. So here I am in South Carolina watching these folks, these Minnesotans over in Italy, competing they're gonna be back home in two weeks to compete for the national championship so i start joking around the office like well how cool would that be to go watch that i mean that like what what sport does this happen you know where you get to compete for the national championship in your own small town that no one really knows yeah and so the guys would do weather.com and point out this minus 55 degree wind chill in bemidji and being from south carolina i'm really not into the cold and so it was this sort of big joke uh, about me going to watch this national championship and uh um, it was a big joke because I was supposed to be in Europe and the day before I'm to leave for Europe, Europeans call cancel the trip. So all of a sudden I've got a free week, which never happens to me in my life. And it perfectly aligns with the U S curling national championship in Bemidji, Minnesota. So this feels like a sign. It feels like an me. omen. And I feel like I'm supposed to go do this. And so you could buy a, t- a, a seat, a reserve seat online, but the period of time to do so had lapsed. So I'm seriously thinking about going, but there's a part of me that's nervous. Like what if it's sold out? You know, or like, what if outsiders really aren't even welcome, right? Mm-hmm. So I get my longtime assistant, Grace, on the case, and <clears throat> I get her to call up there to sort of figure out, can I come? And Grace has a bit of a thicker Southern accent than I, I do, but she calls and gets somebody on the phone and is like, hey, my boss, he just loves that curling, and he comes in here every day talking about it, and I don't know what the heck he's talking about, but he loves it. And I see here on the internet, y'all are having a national championship. I just know he'd love to come up there. Is there any way you can help me get him a ticket? Now, I won't try to do the the, the Minnesota accent in re- response, but you can imagine. Yeah. And at some point, that guy sort of asks, well, you know, where exactly are you calling from? And she says, well, I'm calling from North Carolina because the Fazio office is in Hendersonville, North Carolina. And he says, well, why in the world is somebody from North Carolina interested in curling? And she says, oh, 
well, he's not from North Carolina. He's from South Carolina because I live right across the border in South Carolina. <laughs> and so he chuckled and said, you know, send in the hundred bucks or whatever it is. And not only will we get him a, a seat, we'll get him the best seat we got. And you got to give this man my phone number because anybody that comes from South Carolina to Bemidji to watch curling, I've got to buy that man a drink. So she explained all that to me. I decided, why not? You know, I'll go do this. So I fly in, I fly into the Bemidji Beltrami County Regional Airport about midnight on, on a Sunday night. Might as well be the North Pole. It's like blinding snow. Like it's an environment I've never put myself in ever. And uh, I make my way to the Holiday Inn Express check in, wake up Monday morning, all excited to finally see this sport that I literally have obsessed over it on tele watching it on television. Really excited. So I go downstairs to the stale donut deal and it's empty except for one guy who's Pete Finson, who's the skip or the captain of the U S men's Olympic team that two weeks prior had won the bronze medal at the time, the first and only medal for the United States in curling. Now I've just left Bill Clinton, Tiger Woods, like those are not, that's not a big deal. This is a celebrity as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and so I go up to, I go up to him, which is not like me. And, uh, I say, Pete, congratulations on your success in Bemidji. I mean, in, in Torino, I really enjoyed watching yada, yada. Uh, he's very nice. And, um, and at some point I said, you know, I'm real excited to be here. I just flew in from South Carolina. And as soon as he hears that, he's like, wait, wait, Bo, Bo Welling. Oh my God. Oh my God. You're here. We, we thought you'd changed your mind. We, we we're going to have you be a part of the opening ceremonies on Saturday, but, but you weren't here. Man, you have no idea that the town's excited, the club's excited. This is just so awesome that you're here. So I'm looking around like, am I on a hidden camera television show? Like, what in the world is going on? But apparently, this whole North Carolina, South Carolina shtick, uh, everybody's waiting to see if this nut job would actually show up. And so, in any event, make a long story just a tad bit shorter, they ended up sort of taking me in, um, and I ended up staying nine days. People taking me out ice fishing, getting on the stones, ice to throw curling stones. I had a birthday while I was there. The town threw me a birthday party. At the closing ceremonies, the president of USA Curling names me the official Southern ambassador for the sport of curling. The Olympians come to me and say, hey, this is so cool. You got to walk with us in the Welcome Home U.S. Curler Parade, which is going to start at the Paul Bunyan statue right downtown. Um, so next thing I know, I'm fourth car in the parade, American flag, make my way to the Bemidji Lumberjack High School Gymnasium. I've got a special seat on the floor with the Olympians. It's like this crazy Forrest Gump kind of adventure that you can't make up. And eventually I leave. And I really think this is this is in my rearview mirror. Fast forward two or three months later, I get a call from the new president of USA Curling. She introduced herself and says, hey, I understand you've got some thoughts about our sport. And uh, I, I, I quickly realized that maybe I'd had a cocktail or two at, at night when I was in Bemidji and maybe could have given some unsolicited advice about what I thought they should be doing. So in any event, she wanted to know about that. And so we talked and sort of growing golf and growing curling have some of the same sort of facility challenges. And uh, in any event, she said, Bo, I, uh, I know this is going to sound weird, but we've been asked by the United States Olympic Committee to get somebody on our board uh, that isn't a curler to give us an outside perspective. And everybody thinks with your background in golf that you'd be a, an interesting person. And would you, is there any way we can get you to join the board of USA Curling? So I ended up doing that. And then to make the story much shorter, I, I, I ended up getting super involved with USA Curling that led to me being invited to be a part of the U.S. delegation to the Vancouver Winter Olympics. Um, at that point, I started to get super involved in the World Curling Federation. I started the Palmetto Curling Club here in Greenville. Um, and in 20, I've been to the last two Winter Olympics. Um, so, so, I mean, last three. So, so Vancouver, Sochi, and then Pyeongchang, where the U.S. won the gold medal which was exciting. But in 2018 in Budapest, Hungary at the World Curling Congress, I was elected to the board of the World Curling Federation. And so there, there are eight of us on the board and, um, and I love it. I absolutely love it. It's some of the greatest people on the earth. Um, and you as golfer, uh, you as a golfer would pick it up really, really fast. And you'd very much, much appreciate sort of the traditions of the sport and the camaraderie of the sport. And uh, I really honestly believe that if the world has had more curlers, the world will be a better place. And I think the same can be said about golf as well. So I just feel very fortunate to be involved in these two really special sports. Wow. Wow. Bo. Um, my goodness. So I love what you say there, if the world had more, more curlers, because as you're describing that experience in Minnesota, um, it's sort of like sounds it's like one of those like that only happened in curling, you know, and, and there are sort of those sort of only in golf experiences where people you go somewhere and you're in some town and someone takes you under their wing and, you know, in some far flung place. And you have this crazy adventure because of the connection that you have around golf. And it sounds like the community in curling 
is uh, is pretty similar. Absolutely, it it really is. It's uh, it's it's, it's you know, the both sports are sort of built on you know, sort of values and integrity. And, you know, you call your own fouls and curling, just like mm. you administer your, your own rules in golf. And, um, you don't cheer, uh, you know, a poor shot, you know, you encourage your opponent. Um, you, you begin every curling mat game match, you know, with a handshake and say good curling. And when it's done, you know, the traditions of the sport is that you then go and have a beverage with the team you've just played. Um, and so it's just this incredible sort of friendship building thing and um, I have no doubt that you could blindfold me, take me to any place in the world and allow me to walk into the, a curling club, whatever the local curling club is, and I'd be greeted in, with open arms. And that has nothing to do with me being on the board of the World Curling Federation. It just simply has to do with the culture and nature of curling. That, sound, well, it sounds a lot, of like, a lot like golf, the way you're describing exactly. a handshake. And you say good curling. That's what you say? You do. Yep. Good curling. Good curling. That's going to be my, while the games are on, that's how I'm going to greet people. You mentioned, you talked about calling fouls on yourself, et cetera. Let's get into the rules. Let's get into this game. What is a foul? What are the rules? What just, if you could give us the, you know, you know, we're watching this. Okay. With our novice eyes and okay. I want to get my rock closer to the middle than his rock or her rock. Um, I get that, but maybe you can give us a school us in some of the finer points. Sure. So what you, if you watch the Olympics, there'll be two versions of the sport being played. So both the men and women will play traditional four for person game. But then what starts first is actually a newer version of the game called mixed doubles, which actually starts next Wednesday. I think it, it's the first part, the first competition in the Winter Olympics this year is, is a mixed doubles contest um, across all sports. But in any event, I'll talk about the rules of, of the traditional fours. So each team has four people. And each person throws two stones. And when those 16 stones are played, that's called an end. So kind of like an inning in baseball. Okay. So when you start watching the Olympics, they'll play a 10 end game. And so there'll be a manner where, how, where the order is chosen to start the first end. And so whoever has the last stone, whoever throws the 16th stone, that's sort of a big deal because that stone, um, there's a lot of strategic advantage with the last stone. And so that stone is so special; it has its own name. It's called the hammer. The hammer. And so, I've seen that the hammer. Yes. And so, how the okay. game is scored is after the after sixteen the sixteenth stone, the hammer has been played. However many stones your team has closer to the center of the house, and the house is what looks like the bullseye. That's how many points you would. How many point stones you have closer than my team's nearest stone? That's how many points you would score. So scored kind of like bocce, if you know bocce. And so what happens is. If you score, then in the next end, you don't have hammer. So it quickly becomes, it's a very simple game, but for the game theory of this, it gets complicated pretty quickly because if you have hammer, you really want to score more than one point. And if you don't have hammer, you're trying to get the other team to only take a point so that you can then have hammer for the next end. After 10 ends are played, whoever has the highest score wins. And so it becomes very strategic because there you you start to do lots of things to as a team to try to affect the outcome of the 16th stone. So if you don't have hammer, um, you may start putting up guards to have things out in front of the house. And there's a rule called the the free guard zone. And so until the fifth stone has has been, has been played, a guard uh, not in the house can't be removed. So that starts to create the ability to sort of block and protect other stones. Um, and, and, and then the reason it's called curling is that as the, as the stone or rock goes down the sheet of ice, which a lot of people that have never been in a curling rink don't realize that sheet is about 50 yards long. So half of a football field, I think the mm-hmm. perception you get on television, it's, is that it's much closer, yeah. but in any event, as it goes down the sheet of ice, the skip or the captain of the team has called a shot and he's called the rotation on the stone. So we use words like draw and fade in golf. Those words in curling are out turn and in turn. And so as the rock goes down the ice, it'll curve or curl in the direction of rotation about four to eight feet, depending on the conditions of the ice. So that then allows you to throw stones and go around guards and position stones in certain ways that, that they can't be hit. So the, so if you 
throw the ball, throw the stone hard, it's going to go straighter, right? So in some ways, it sort of becomes like team putting because what the sweeping huh. does is it reduces the friction on the stone. And by doing so, the stone will go farther, but almost more importantly, it won't spin as much, so it'll go straighter. And so the net of all of that is that it's a person sort of calling strategy, calling the shot. There's a person delivering the stone and then two other people sweep, sweeping. And they're all trying to place these stones in certain places and manipulate the trajectory by which they get there. So the simple golf analogy of what I've just tried to explain, and I've probably explained it poorly, is that imagine you've got a, a right to left breaking putt. And as soon as you hit it, um, you realized you've not you've not placed, you've not aimed far enough to the right and you're going to miss low. What you can, the, the equivalency in curling is that you can scream to your teammates and they can sweep and they can keep that putt from breaking and get that, get that ball to the hole. So that's quick and dirty, the sort of physics of it. I like it. So and think of it as if you're on like really grainy Bermuda, your teammates could run over and brush it, the grain out of it to hold its line or something like that. All right. To use the it's, golf. It's something like that. The, the yeah. difference that, so the, the rotation in a, a putt, um, the curvature of a putt is by due to gravity. Right. Whereas in curling, the ice is very flat, but they've sprayed what they call the pebble on top of the ice. So it's almost like these little, little bumps, uh, almost like exposed aggregate ice, if you will. And so what the sweeping does is it manipulates the shape of the pebble and that affects this rotation. That's and so that's what allows it to keep it straighter. That's huge. I didn't know that about yep. the pebbles in the spring of the ice because I'm watching these folks scrubbing the ice and I'm thinking of it like an ice rink that someone just went over with a Zamboni. I'm like, how much smoother is it going to get? And they've been, you've been, you know, sweeping the ice all day. It's got to be as smooth as I'm sure it's already smooth. Like what is it really making a difference? All that, like, you know, someone's yep. back there screaming at them and they're going, oh, like as fast as they can. It's, it is making a difference. It's huge difference. So they, they get huh. the ice when the, 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 the so the equivalent of, of the golf course superintendent is the ice maker in curling. So the ice makers will get the ice perfectly flat, right? They'll scrape it down such as dead flat. And then they'll come and spray this fine mist of water. And that actually makes it not smooth. It makes it have the, the ice have uh. less contact with the stone, right? So friction, so, so st friction is related to mass. So, even though it's ice and you think, oh, it's, you know, not a lot of friction, the curling stone weighs 42 pounds. And so friction is, is correlated to mass. And so the whole thing is about reducing the surface area of ice contact with the stone. And so the, what the sweeping does is it manipulates that, but then yeah. it quickly freezes right back. So the ice stays with this pebble throughout the course uh, of the 10 yeah. end game. No wonder this, I, I can see where the physics inside of you is. Or this appeals. So I have a curling. I have a curling stone here because I thought you might ask. So 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 Heck first let's yeah. see if I can lift lift it. So it's forty two pounds, pounds, right? Okay. So I'm gonna turn point. it over. So this is the running surface, and I don't know if you can tell, but like the only part that's gonna touch the ice is this little rim right ah, here. Ah, yes. Okay. And so, so it's with not the pebble, flat. Only, there's not a huge amount of surface area contact between the stone, the running edge of the stone and the surface of the ice itself. And so that's what's getting manipulated with the sweeping. I am glad. Thank you for showing us the curling stone, but I'm glad that comes up because who's making the stones? Um, are they all, and where they're coming from does have that golf, another golf connection. That's one fun fact so, I know you can tell us about. Yep. So historically, curling stones all came from the granite that I just showed you all came from uh, Elsa Craig off the coast of sort of Turnberry, Troon, the mm -hmm. big, that big island you see out rock, in yeah. the water. So, and the majority of curling stones still come from there. And the big manufacturer of curling stones is something called K's of Curling. Um, and uh, it's an old historic company sort of based right there. And so um, to pretty much, there are, there are a few other quarries now, but, but, but an incredible percentage of curling stones all come from Elsa Craig. Yeah, so the Olympic stones. Including this one I just showed you. Oh, really? Very nice. Yep. Nothing but the best. And yep. so the Olympic stones are coming from off the coast of Turnberry, which right. the granite on the golf course uh, for the signs, signage and stuff is also from that big rock. Um, yep. I would love to see someone. It's, you know, it's this volcanic plug or whatever. Um, 
I can't imagine people going out there and working there, but I imagine there's some way to get. Have you ever been to it? I've never been. Several of my colleagues on the board have been. Um, It's a it's a bird sanctuary, but there is this lease for for the caves of curling caves of curling to to quarry stone off of there. Okay. And so like once a year stones will go and be big slabs of the granite will go and be harvested and brought back over the mainland where the manufacturing process happens. That's cool. And I imagine they last quite a long time. Once you've got They do. Stones. So the Elsa granite um, is some of the hardest rock on the planet. And I think that's that's why it gets used. Um, but yeah, they'll they'll last for decades, decades long. So just to, to touch on the strategy again, to make sure I've got this clear. So yep. say I've got the hammer and it looks like I'm only going to get one point. And so you only get multiple points if you have multiple, clo- if you're closer, if you have two closer than they're the, your opponent's next closest one. So meaning that's right. I've got one on the dot and then I've got a couple other close ones, but uh, the second closest is there. So I only get the one point. So right. if I only if I'm only getting that one point and I have the hammer, do I want to not score so that I can get the hammer? Would I get the hammer back in the second in the next so, one if there were no so points? So it kind of depends on what's happening in the house. So the example you just said, if you have one you, you have the the counting stone if you will, and but you have some other stones in the house, but there's one of your opponents that's in there, what you might try to do is throw your last stone, the hammer, and knock that opponent's stone out so that you score more. So two, right. three, four, whatever it is. If it was such that you you didn't um, you didn't have anything in the house and your opponent had one in the house, then you what you would do is throw your stone and try to knock their stone out and have your stone also go out such that there is no stones in the house. And if that happens, if there isn't a score in an end, then you still keep the hammer. Okay. And so that's called a blank end. All right. And so that becomes a strategic thing tool as well, because let's say um, it's a tight game and you're in the ninth out of 10 ends and you have hammer and you might purposely try to score zero such as you keep the hammer for the, for the very last end. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's almost be like that, you know, these crazy NFL games of like who has the, ball last wins to be right. kind, of, kind of that kind of mentality. Um, but so that's, that's, that's what sort of the, what are the tools? It's, it's like you either score zero, one or more than one. And so if you have hammer, you basically want to score more than one or zero. Um, and if you don't have hammer, you're trying to get the other team to score one. Very cool. So difficulty wise, I'm a novice. There is a, um, there's a curling club here in Philadelphia. Um, and I'm sure where people are listening, there's, Heck, you made one happen in South Carolina, so uh, they're out there. Uh, if we were going to try it, how tough is it? I don't know if I could get in that position of. Um, is there a version of the game where you can just be standing up? Because I feel like I'd never get back up from that that lunge. There is. There's there's a version called um, stick curling. Is what it's called. A lot of times, there's an apparatus that you can stand and used to deliver the stone okay. um curling is also a paralympic sport so our wheelchair curlers use the stick delivery device um and as an aside the world curling federation i think is the only uh, uh international federation that has a, a sport in both the olympics and the paralympics but um any event that you see you will see stick cooler cur- cur- curlers but tom Come on, you can do it. There's no problem. You got, uh, you, okay. you got it. No All problem. Right. So what what I found in because like I've, <laughs> I've helped introduce a lot of people to curling over the over the last 15 years, and what I find is that it's it's actually relatively easy to pick up initially, but it's hard. It takes time and effort to become good, and um, okay. and so your slide sliding initially wouldn't be the greatest, but you'd be able to do it. You'd be able to participate. You'd be able to have fun. Uh, and then you would just get better as you as your balance improved kind of through time. But you as a golfer would pick up this the, these rules and the strategy incredibly fast. I've, I've been amazed at how many golfers I've taken to curling. And uh, I mean, it's, it's, the, it's night and day difference about how fast they get what's going on versus a non-golfer. Huh. In fact, I took an ex uh, here in Greenville and an ex uh, Corn Ferry tour player um, – picked it up and he now he he curls every single time they curl like he he loves it he, he absolutely wow. thinks it's the greatest thing ever 
We should have. I mean, I feel like if in golf we had the stymie, um, it would we would be more fun in match play, and that would be more like. Curling. And it's, this is kind of like that. These these right. guards are kind of like stymies. It's yeah. the same sort of. You can see again they kind of come out of the same sort of Scottishness, if you will. Can you wipe out uh, curling injuries? Um, the dangers of curling that are widely it, talked it, about. Uh, I guess it, it's just pride if you just wipe out on the ice. It does happen. There, there are injuries, um, and it can be scary. I mean, with the head, you know, being in contact with the ice. So uh, we're very careful when we are teaching people to be very cognizant of, uh, of you know, it's a very slippery surface. So um, you <laughs> will see people see. fall for sure. The equipment, um, you can't just get it. I noticed at Dick's, they did not have a curling department. Um, where does it, who makes this? Not yet. Where do you get it? One day. I hope so. There are curling supply companies. Um, and so, you know, generally speaking, you need a broom and you need, you need sort of special shoes. That's if you're serious about it. If you just want to go try it out, like your local club will have all the equipment for you uh, to sort of give it a, give it a go. But you, when you, when you're delivering the stone, you slide out on one foot and that surface of that shoe uh, when you're sliding needs to be, you know, not a lot of friction. So, um, you'll see shoes made out of Teflon bottoms or steel bottoms. Um, and then you n- normally will have a, 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 a gripping thing that you'll put over your slider so that when you're not sliding, when you're sweeping, then you can grip the ice better. Ah, so I should have okay. said, I should have said in the beginning with the four people throwing the two stones is this a big rotation of, of how all that works. And so you, you play in the same same sort of order. And so everybody, except for the skip or the captain, everyone takes a turn at sweeping. Uh, whereas the skip or the captain, the one calling a strategy stands behind the house until it's his or her time to go deliver. Would they go last? Uh, his or her two stones. T- t- typically they would go last. There's not, a, it's not actually in the rules. So we have okay. some, you'll see some teams at the Olympics where the skip is not throwing last, but they're still calling the strategy. But historically the skip through, through the final stones. I am so excited to watch some curling now. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, when this when this podcast goes out, Bo, I believe we'll be in the finals um, okay. at that time. So maybe we'll get a prediction and see if uh, it comes true. Can you handicap the field for us? Or how do our chances look this year? Um, I assume you're talking to us now, so you're probably not going. Yeah, I mean, I was all set to go, and... Uh the uh with the rules to get in um oh right sure. I, i'm not able to go so uh, you can only get the visa if you have an operational reason so from our from the world curling federation our staff and some of our officials will be there but our president will be there but other than that um th- we're not really allowed to go so Could that's unfortunate that rock there though and been like hey, <laughs> that's right curler. it'll be the first uh olympics i haven't been to since that torino one huh. but the united states uh the team returning on the men's side is is three members of the of the team that won the gold medal in Korea Ooh, last like time. That. So um, they will be a contender, I think, for sure. I think technically the United States was ranked fourth in the world right now on the men's side. Um, but they, if they play well, they they should be uh, should be a contender. And then on the women's side, uh, we are sending some of the same uh, women that went before. In, in Korea, um, but they're they're playing in a different order. So Tabitha Peterson is going to be the skip who played vice skip or third last time. And then Nina Roth, who was skip, is playing third. So they've sort of switched their order. Um, but they, uh, they've got a great, great team as well. And I think we're probably ranked fifth or sixth on the women's side in the, in the world. But I think both teams have, have, a, have, a, have a chance. And then I mentioned earlier, there's a, this newer version called Mixed Doubles. And so um, Chris Plies and Vicky Persinger will be playing, representing the United States for that. And, and Chris is on the men's fours team. So he's going to have a full week. He'll, he'll, he'll be curling for about 20 straight days. Um, but they too, um, Mixed Doubles kind of is kind of anything can happen. Um, but they will, they will, they're both experienced and um, between Chris and Vicky, they, I, I wouldn't, it, it, it wouldn't shock me at all if they don't come home with a medal. For all our gambling degenerate friends out there, who are you putting your money on? Um, gosh, I wonder if you can gamble. Can you gamble on curling? And if, if so, am I getting an inside scoop? Let's do this. So, it, you know, the Canadians are always a favorite. So there are okay. one and a half million curlers in the world and 1.2 million of them are in Canada. So, um, so they're always a favorite. But 
both Sweden and Switzerland have really, really highly developed high performance programs. And huh. um, I think I think they're probably both ranked one and two in the in the world. So I would say that uh, Sweden, Switzerland, Canada, United States, um, what about Scotland, the Korea, where the game came from. And Our Scotland Scottish is friends. right there, too. So Scotland's probably just behind uh, the U.S. On, on both sides. It's, 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 it's played as a round robin. So, be, you know, 10 team round robin. Um, okay. And then from that will be a, a playoff. And so, you know, what they're all be vying for is just trying to get into the playoff. And, yeah. and it's, it's always amazing how momentum becomes a big thing. And uh, so, like when the, when the, when John Schuster and the U.S. Men won last time, they were basically were out of it. I mean, they they had lost to teams they shouldn't have lost to, and then proceeded to win like the last five games, uh, which culminated in the, in the gold medal over Sweden. And uh, it was huge because I'd say their chances of going forward were pretty close to zero uh, when they just got hot and uh, and all of a sudden got the momentum on their side. So, well, let's hope can that, happen. let's hope it happens again for. Team USA, Bo, you have immeasurably increased the, uh, my enjoyment of curling. I know. I cannot wait to watch some now. And I'm sure you've done the same for the, our listeners. Uh, just getting into the strategy uh, and the passion you have for it is contagious. When this conversation started, I would have said you're the most interesting man in golf. Now you are the most interesting man in golf and curling, which <laughs> in, in, in two sports. So um, it is awesome to speak with you. And look forward to either seeing you uh, on a golf course soon, or what the heck? Let's 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 curl. I'd love to do that, and I, I want to thank you, Tom. Uh, the uh, I gave my father your latest book for Christmas, and uh, he's a man that can be hard to please sometimes. Great guy, but you know what do you get him? And uh, I'm not sure I've seen him as happy on a Christmas in a long time. I think he read half of it there uh, before the for the end of the of, of, of the Christmas day. So thank you very much, Bo. You're awesome. Thank you for saying that. That's that's very generous of you. And so, as I, I guess we say at the, uh, is it the curling rink? What do we call it? The lanes? Cur- curling rink or curling club. Yep. At the club, good curling. That's right. Good curling. Good curling right. to you. All right. Sounds good. Be I well. I appreciate it, Tom. Thank you. <laughs>